Hi everyone, I trust that you guys are well. It's been a bit of a while, uh, but welcome back to my YouTube channel. Welcome back to another episode of Finance Friday. Now, three weeks ago, I put up a video about savings mistakes that we are making and ways in which I feel we are sabotaging our savings. I really loved the feedback on that video. You guys um, had some follow-up questions and you really, really wanted to know like what I recommend in terms of where then should you put your money. But then um, I also thought that there's something very, very, very important to address with regard to savings that I feel um, is going to answer the questions that you had about where you should put your money. So in today's episode, I want to take you through four savings avenues that are very, very popular, especially here in Kenya, that I absolutely do not recommend. I'm going to tell you why I don't recommend them as well. So in case you're interested to finding out what these savings um, avenues are, stick around. Let's get into it. I'm going to keep this very short and sweet because I need us to just get the facts and the data. The first savings avenue that I absolutely do not recommend, and I think I mentioned this in that previous video, FYI, if you missed out on that particular video, I'm going to link it down in the description box down below so that you can be able to understand where we are coming from in today's video. The first option is merry-go-round charmers. Now, I talked a lot about, or rather I mentioned them in passing during that video, but I noticed that a lot of you still have questions around why you should not save in merry-go-round charmers and what the options are, okay? Now, what I, I, I made very clear in uh, the previous video is that the biggest reason as to why I don't recommend merry-go-round charmers is because most of them hold money in cash, whether that is cash, cash, like liquid cash, or cash in somebody's bank account or even in somebody's M-Pesa or M-Shwari, especially if you're here in Kenya. The problem with having money in a chama or in a merry-go-round chama that is put in cash or that is kept in cash is that it is ignoring the concept of inflation. Now, one of the most important things, guys, that you, ca you should understand or you should endeavor to learn is how inflation is affecting you, not just as a consumer, but as a saver. I feel like we understand how inflation affects us as consumers because it's very evident when you go to the supermarket and you realize that um, maize flour is more expensive than it was or cooking oil has doubled in price or whatever. So you're able to actually know how it's affecting you as a consumer. But a lot of us don't know how inflation affects us as savers. Now, if inflation is at 7% here in Kenya, it doesn't just mean that the prices of goods, services, and commodities has gone up by 7%. While that may be true, it also means that the value of your money wherever it is stored is also depreciating or being devalued by the rate of 7%. Now, if your money is stored in cash, if you are your usual way of saving, like you don't have any other way of saving other than like merry-go-round, it means that your money is still remaining in cash. It is not earning any interest whatsoever. OK, and therefore your money is actually being devalued. Some of us are saving for, let's say, education, Christmas at the end of the year. But guys, remember what this money can do for you at the beginning of the year is going to it's 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 not going to be the same thing at the end of the year because that money will have depreciated by seven, eight, nine percent, depending on the rate of inflation that year. On top of that is that the truth is, if most of us are actually being honest, we have just been in chamas for years and we've been waiting for our chama to finally work. I talk to so many people who tell me they're in chamas and they actually tell me that, you know, we've saved in this group for three years now, two years now. And I ask them, what's the plan? Have you guys come up with something to do with the money? And most of you are still waiting for there to be a plan of what this money is for, where it can be invested, how you can do, what you can do to grow and to multiply it. The biggest reason why we are staying in these chamas is pretty much just social reasons because you don't want to leave. Maybe you started it with your relatives or with some ladies that are from your workplace or your church. So most of us are stuck. If we have been very honest, we're just stuck because of social reasons. And we are also stuck because of a lack of discipline. So many people also justify 
being in chamas because they think that um, it helps them to be disciplined. So they tell me, coach, by myself, I cannot put this money aside. But then when I'm in a group setting, it will force me to contribute. Now, you're addressing the wrong problem. Instead of dealing with your discipline issues, when it comes to saving, you are enabling those um, you're pretty much like enabling the lack of discipline. So that's one of the reasons I do not um, recommend chamas. You're not uh, compensated for inflation. So your money is losing uh, its value in a merry-go-round chama. Number two, you're dealing with a lot of, you're doing it for social reasons, not necessarily logical and financial reasons. And the third reason is that you are not taking advantage of what that money could do for you. It's in cash, it's in a bank account, and yet in a chama, that money could actually, um, in a chama that prioritizes, let's say, investment, that money could ideally be growing and earning new interest and building you some wealth or even some passive income. So towards the end of this video, I'm going to give you other options or avenues that I feel are the best to uh, save your money in. So if you want to find out what those are, keep watching. The second group of savings avenues that I do not recommend is unregulated self-help groups or unregulated chamas. Now, I am talking about groups in church, groups um, of some merchants. I've even met people who start like an informal self-help group in their, let's say you you operate in the same market, you operate in the same area. I do not, I absolutely do not recommend these things. While they might be good for fostering that discipline and that sense of community because you guys are working together, saving together, you're probably even able to take a loan or two. The problem with them is the unregulatedness of them. Now, if you're in the, such a group or you're in such a circle, in fact, just yesterday I had a client conversation um, with one of the ladies who I've been working with and I've been coaching and she told me that she's been brought for some forms uh, where she, you know, her brother wanted her to join a particular circle um, that they want to both start saving in and she was, she just wanted me to look into it now. Um, after looking into it, I realized the circle is not registered anywhere, um, which ideally means that it is not regulated. We all know the regulator of circles is SASRA, S-A-S-R-A. -S I'm going to leave a link to SASRA down below so that you can actually go and search and find out if the circle you're in is actually regulated by um, SASRA. So obviously my advice to her was uh, to definitely not join it and look for a circle that is actually regulated. Now, I'll tell you the problem with this unregulated self-help groups and unregulated circles. The biggest of them being that they are not necessarily being guided or being held accountable by the regulator. The whole point of having a regulator like SASRA is to ensure that they are not exceeding like the, let's say there are some controls, fin some financial controls that are usually put in place by the regulator to ensure that these people are still operating within safe parameters. Um, it is also to ensure that they do not go ba bankrupt or get to a point of insolvency. And even if they do get there, then they are sh they are, there's also some um, backup to ensure that clients end up accessing their money. Now, when you get yourself into an unregulated self-help group and an unregulated circle, as much as it may work maybe in the short term to medium term, what you're doing is that you're exposing yourself to the risk of one day there have been mismanagement of funds in that particular self-help group or in that particular circle and the law or there will be no legal recourse that you can actually take. You see with regulated companies or regulated firms, there is that aspect of uh, being held accountable. There's someone you can go to if at all there's an issue with you being able to access the money. But with a group that we just formed of us, like three people or 10 people or 50 people in a particular group, no one particularly like in legal or in government can hold that particular self-help group or that particular circle um, accountable. So you're really, really exposing yourself to the possibility of if anything ever went wrong, you wouldn't possibly be able to recover your money. Now, maybe one thing I would like to say is that I know a lot of these self-help groups and a lot of these circles that are popular. And in case you forget anything I've said today, I'd like you to remember that popular doesn't mean regulated.
right guys so there there are like a, a lot of people are like oh tunajoy sako imekuwa hapa for many years like it's been here for so many years so we know it the fact that a, an institution or a group or a sako is popular doesn't necessarily mean that it is licensed and regulated popularity doesn't mean anything please as popular as the group is or as popular as the sako is the only way to confirm that you're in safe hands is to ensure that they are licensed and they are regulated by the responsible regulator of self help groups as well as sacos now this third option might really piss some of you off but i got to tell you guys the truth now here in kenya only there has been so many savings apps that are being launched every day i'm not going to name names because that's not what we are here to do we want to just learn and understand the pros and cons but like there are so many apps there's this new app where you even you and your friends can contribute and save in a 52 weeks challenge there's another app and you know they, they, they they've now become popular and common i will tell you why i do not recommend all of these savings apps okay the biggest problem there are two very big issues with the savings apps that we currently have that are coming up and many of us are using those savings apps instead of using like let's say for example a money market fund for our savings one of the things that is very prominent with these savings apps is that there are charges i don't necessarily like calling them hidden charges but they are not necessarily advertised charges right so you see how um i'll be selling you an app and i'll tell you you get 8% from this app 9% from this savings app but i'm also not telling you i've noticed two things the first thing is that these apps are actually charging you every time you top up right and every time you withdraw money you are also being charged does that make sense guys so you find that on top of management fees on top of um you know taxation that is obvious in savings avenues that are earning you an interest there's also top up and withdrawal uh, charges some of these top up and withdrawal charges are actually um uh, owing to mpesa transaction costs so a lot of us are also ignoring that another big challenge um and one of the reasons why i highly highly um discourage just uh taking on a savings app just because it is popular and just because it has been advertised a lot on social media is that you guys are being ripped off in terms of interest i'm just going to come out and say it you're being ripped off so one of these very popular um savings apps here in kenya actually gives around 6-7% on that individual savings platform but then there's uh, i think the 52 week um uh, challenge where they give you like 8% i mean most money market funds just a normal money market fund here in kenya will give you 10% 11% but you are saving in an app that is giving you 8% per annum return okay on top um now while giving you that 8% remember there's still 15% withholding tax on your returns there's top up charges and there's withdrawal charges so you may not really be noticing it and that is why they are called hidden charges not because they are hidden but because a lot of us don't pay attention to them so my question is guys what other reason would you have to put money in a particular app for example right that gives you um you know 8% while you could be getting 11 12% in your typical money market fund and can i be very honest with you guys um most of these apps are just building up on money market funds so to be honest guys if i were in some of y'all's shoes I would definitely choose to remain with my mainstream money market funds and right now MMFs are doing quite well because uh treasury bills are also doing well. The underlying asset in money market funds is treasury bills. Now treasury bills in Kenya right now are giving up to 15%, 16% per annum return. Because of that we are seeing money market funds give up to 12, 13 even 14 and 15% here in Kenya so you are getting ripped off when someone is uh, convincing you or selling you a particular savings app that is giving you 8 9% when you could be getting 11 12% in your typical money market fund that doesn't charge you to withdraw and does not charge you to um of course um top up 
um, other than your usual, let's say, bank or M-Pesa transaction charges. So what am I saying? I have nothing against these savings apps, but I just need to ensure that you guys are paying attention before you join a savings app. Just because influencers are talking about it, um, just because it has been very, uh, it has been made very popular on social media, does not mean that it is good for you. Pay attention to what we are calling hidden charges: the cost of withdrawal, the cost of um, topping up, um, and even the interest rate that you are getting. I know money market funds sometimes seem and look very boring, but they are still your best bet in terms of getting the best interest rate and also getting your interest compounded on a daily or even on a monthly basis. So I would pay attention to those savings apps. So the last savings avenue that I do not recommend is your traditional bank accounts and traditional bank fixed deposit accounts. Now, I want to let you in on a little secret, guys. Your money that is in a bank account is pretty much a liability to them. Hear me out. I want to explain this. Why I say it is a liability to the bank, it is because it is money that they owe someone. What's an asset? An asset is what you own, all right? And what's a liability? A liability is what you owe. So you as a person who puts your money regularly, let's say in a traditional savings account or even in a traditional fixed deposit account, that money is actually a liability to the bank. Why? Because they owe it to you. They, they need to give it back to you at some point. I hope you've gotten it up until that point. Now, for this money that you've given the bank to make sense to them, because of course they're not running a charity, they're running a business. For this money to make sense to them, they have to put it to work. So what is the highest income generating activity of any and all banks in the world? It is lending. So that is actually how they make money. So when your money is sat in a traditional savings account in a bank, when your money is sat in a traditional fixed deposit account in a bank, it's not like they're they've just sat there and then, you know, they're just waiting for you to come back for their money, for your money and growing your money. No, 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 no. What they're doing is that they're putting that money to work, all right? And they are lending it out at, you know, so they're giving out mortgages at 13% and other loans at like 9, 11, however much percent that they are doing for interest rate so that they can actually make uh, money using that money. Before, Susan decides that, oh, you know what? It's time for me to withdraw that money. Let me tell you what the problem is with that. Your money is being put to work by someone else. It's like you've lent me money. It's like you have no use for it, okay? You've given me money and you're like, Susan, um, keep this 20000 for me, all right? I'm going to come collect it when I need it. That is your traditional, maybe current a bank account or even a savings account. And most of these bank accounts, so number one is that you're missing out on investment opportunities. The bank is giving you like, um, or rather a good return opportunity. The bank is giving you your typical 5%, 6%, maybe 7% on whatever savings account you have with them. But remember, they are making way more than that using your money. The problem I have with that is that if I had that money and I put it in a money market fund, I'll earn 12% compounded interest on that money. While if it was sat in a bank account, I would earn only 6 or 7%. Does that make sense, guys? So the problem with traditional bank accounts is that A, they are ripping you off on interest rates. And then number two, and this is the most ignored aspect of leaving your money sat in a traditional bank account, the way your interest is calculated. Now, I'm going to take you back to school. If you remember that we had two types of interest calculations, we had what we call a simple interest calculation method. And that one is um, principal times rate times time, right? Very simple. So you take out the money that someone put in, multiply by the rate, which is like 7% per annum, 8% per annum times the time. So if you've done quarterly, that is like, uh, let's say three out of um, 12 months. If it's a whole year, then it's one year, or, you know, 365 out of 365. That's just the calculation. However, money market funds, for instance, compound your interest. So let me tell you what that means. If I... Um, put my money in a bank account, maybe I have 1 million sat there, my interest is going to be calculated on that straight line method 
uh, 1 million times 8% times one year. So my principal from month one to month 12, assuming I left that money from January, I mean from January all the way to December, that means that my money is actually just going to remain at, like my interest is the same. If it is 9,000 or if it's 6,000, however much it's going to be, um, it's a, a, a solid figure the whole uh, 12 months. However, in a money market fund, because they compound your interest on a monthly basis, your principal is going to grow from like 1 million in month one. And then in month two, it's going to be maybe say 1 million 6,000 and something. And then in month, tr month three, maybe 1 million 13,000 and something. Why? Because the principal of the next month, your principal um, is pretty much increasing. All right. As your, your interest is also being compounded. In other words, the interest that you earned from last month um, is being compounded to form a new principle for this month. Now, I know this sounds like a lot of jargon, so I'm going to insert an image here um, so that you guys can see what I'm talking about in terms of compounding. So merely by merit of how your interest is being calculated in a bank versus how your interest is being calculated in a money market fund, over the, uh, a period of maybe two to three years, you would make more money in a, a money market fund at the same interest rate as opposed to how much you would actually make in a bank just because of how your interest is actually being calculated, all right? So those two issues, the return that you're getting and how your return is also calculated and the fact that you've given up your money to be used in lending as opposed to you taking charge and taking control, all right, and saving that money in avenues that actually are getting you as much of an interest as possible. So that is the biggest reason why I do not recommend leaving your money in traditional bank accounts. I've said this on this channel before and I'm going to repeat it again. Banks are pretty much for short term um, putting of your money and majorly for transaction charges. Or if you're interested in credit facilities, then you can um, build your credit in that way. But not for saving, not for beating inflation, and definitely not for investment purposes. Now, as a parting shot, what I'm going to say, if you've noticed all of these four savings avenues that I don't recommend, the merry-go-round chamas, the unregistered or unregulated self-help groups and circles, um, the savings apps that are so popular right now in Nairobi and also um, the traditional bank accounts, they all have one thing in common. They do not compensate you for inflation. In other words, they are devaluing your money, yet we have many other opportunities of actually being able to earn an interest that compensates you for inflation. So if I was to recommend a good starting point, if you want to save for Maybe like the short term to medium term. So I'm talking any money that you need to save for more than six months. All right. Maybe like five to six months. So I'm talking like your emergency fund savings, your school fees savings, um, any savings that are pretty much going to extend between the short term to medium term. The most important thing for you to look for is an account, a regulated um, account, for example, money market funds, which I highly, highly recommend that um, will on the bare minimum compensate you for inflation. So how do you know you're being compensated? Just find out what the inflation rate in Kenya is. Right now it's around 7-8%. So if I was looking for a good savings avenue, I would get one that gives me more than 8%. So I'm looking at upwards of 9, 10, 11%. That way your savings, whatever it is that you're saving them for in the future, even with inflation at that particular point, you would still ideally be able to afford that thing. So I really hope you have gotten some more insights um, now that I've uh, made this second video to just clarify what I was talking about in the previous video. In case you have any questions, you know what to do. Leave them down in the um, comment section down below. So thank you so much for watching. Remember to share this video with your friends. We said we are not gatekeeping any information in 2024 so that they can also stay financially woke and financially literate. Like this video as well and also turn on the notification bell so that you can be notified every time I upload a new video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next Friday.